Come on, church, let's give them some praises tonight. See, you guys are singing new songs like you know them already. That's the kind of night we're having. I like that. So you guys are singing like you don't care if you're out of tune. It might bother the person next to you, but it don't bother me. I'm just kidding. We love you regardless. But I want to take a quick moment. I want to welcome every person that's here today. I want to welcome the new guest today. I want to say this, because I had a conversation in my office earlier this week, but it's not the first time I've had this conversation. Whether you know scripture or not, doesn't determine how much you can engage and you can get from tonight. I said it this morning, you may not know a Bible verse from a Tupac lyric, but it's okay. It's the truth. The words are going to be on the screen, scripture is going to be on the screen. It doesn't matter how much you know, don't know, how long you've been coming or not, where you are in your faith and where, and where you are in your walk with God. You don't have to believe to belong tonight. You don't have to look a certain part. You don't have to talk a certain way to belong tonight. We welcome you here. We're glad you're here. I hope you get something out of tonight. I hope God speaks to you directly tonight. In these words and straight out of his mouth. I hope that for you. See, we say it all the time that we love you the way that you are. God loves you the way that you are. But he loves you so much to not leave you that way. I pray that you leave changed tonight. I pray that your heart gets mended tonight. I pray that your life feels full tonight when you leave and you're able to take that into your day to day from Monday through Saturday. And if you can't make it through Monday, then I dare you to come back and get filled again tomorrow night as you make sandwiches and serve. And if you can't, do, you can't get through Tuesday, you got a place to be here at 645 in our life recovery meeting. There's a place for you to be filled. And if you can't get through Wednesday, then you can go ahead and come through for the Bible study. And if you can't get through Thursday, they're prepping meals again. And if you can't get through Friday, there's somewhere for you to be on Friday too. There's something here for you, for everybody, each and every day of the week. It's not just through a pastor preaching to you that you can get filled. And it's not just on Sunday that you can get filled so that you can pour yourself out through the week. There's, there's, you have access. Understand that. You have access. Tell somebody, I have access. Now tell, tell your second favorite, I have access. Okay? When you're feeling empty, you can jump into the Bible. When you're feeling empty, you can download the Bible app and you can read the verse of the day. You have access. So don't just depend on Sunday. Sunday is good. And Sunday is where you get to get the tools and you get to be equipped and you get to be led. But you can lead your own Bible study. You can lead your own, your own prayer time. God wants time with you. So remember that. And like I said, I hope you get something today. Father God, we come before you. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. I come to glorify you. I pray that my words glorify you. I pray that my study time glorifies you. I pray that as I recall the notes, Lord, I recall your revelation that it glorifies you. I pray that every word that I speak points a light to you, Father God, not to me, not to the things that I've done, not to the things that I've come across, not to my experience, Lord, but to you, to you, to you, the things that you've given me, Lord, to the things that you've spoken to me, God, to the things that you've allowed me to experience, you allowed me to overcome, to those things, Lord, to you, to your credibility, to your reputation, I pray that we point a light to you each and every day of our lives, Father God, in our words, in our actions, in our thoughts, Father God. So we pray that you have this service, that you take complete control, that you remove me from the equation, Father God, that you speak through me, Lord, and that right now that you would take these last few moments before we start, Lord, to, be, to just till the, the leftover soil, the hardened soil of any heart here that's still in doubt, that's still curious, that's still trying to figure things out, Lord, that you would break the ground right now so that the seed that's about to be dropped today would fall on good soil and would be able to be watered and nourished and grow this week, Father God. So we love you, we thank you, and we're ready to hear from you. And your name we pray, and everybody said, amen. Man, I'm telling you, it's a different type of night, man. I'm feeling good tonight. And I'm telling you, I'm going off of, I'm going off of like two hours of sleep, okay? Maybe a little bit more. I hit the melatonin last night. My wife's like, what are you talking about? You slept last night. I got up. And this is the reason why I, I, didn't, I, didn't, uh, I didn't sleep too much uh, last night, and really for a while. But you can welcome her into our family. She's here, y'all. See, it was funny, because I talked about getting my baby prematurely, and she had her own plans, and she came a whole month early. Like, she was like, I hear that you're saying not soon enough, so I'm going to 
test that right now, and we're going to come sooner rather than later. So again, she is gorgeous. She is beautiful, but she is fire too. So and we're learning that. On top of that, can you go ahead and give my wife a round of applause? <laughs> Crystal, you make post-pregnancy look good. That's what I'm saying. You know, we also want to go ahead. He's not here tonight. And our first lady's not here tonight, but can we go ahead and honor our pastor and first lady, Pastor Jeff and Monica Hill? Yeah. Taking a break, and they definitely deserve it. They run the place. They do things that we do not see. They run 24-7, and they deserve a break for sure. So we want to go ahead and just keep them in our prayers as they take some time off. He's definitely going to, pastor's going to definitely come back next week and bring the fire as we continue in Joshua. But that's what I'm called to do today, continue in Joshua. And as we talk about these things, and we, I give you a quick overview of what we've talked about in the last few weeks, don't get all upset because you might have missed a week or you don't know what we're talking about. It's okay. Like I said, the words are going to be on the screen, and you have access to YouTube or Facebook to go ahead and jump on those old videos from the last few weeks in the sermon, and you want to make sure that you get in on them. If you took notes, jump back into your notes again. If you didn't, go ahead and take your notes from watching the videos this week. I challenge you to do that. You don't just come to church to hear a word, listen to it, and then drop it and go off and do your own thing again. Take it. Learn it. Practice it. Write notes on it. Study it. Teach somebody. Show somebody. Tell somebody what you learned. Okay, so if you go ahead and we can, we can throw up those maps here. This is where we're at, okay? We used to have these maps that showed the 40-year uh, journey of Israel. Now I want to go ahead and we jumped into Joshua, right? And so now we're talking about the battles that Joshua fought, right? And, and uh, so we are over here now. I love this laser pointer. It's so good, okay? And Israel has taken over this land over here, and we have preached so far up until this arrow over here. We've taken over the west side of the Jordan and the southwest side, actually, and you can see these arrows over here. If you look on the map on this side, you see these numbers over here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is where we've preached so far. These are the areas and the territory that the, the Israelites have taken over here, and now what I'm about to jump into is eight and nine. All, these, all this land up here, this arrow over here, we're going to be talking about this tonight. So just so you have an idea of what we're talking about, where we're going tonight, so you can get like a mental picture, right? So we've talked about Moses. We've talked about the journey. We've talked about getting to the promised land. We've talked about Moses dying. And now for the last couple of weeks, we've talked about Joshua taking over. Okay? And we've talked about a few things. And here's the next slide. It's going to tell you just really quick, a really quick recap. We talked about Joshua and the priest stepping into the Jordan to stop the water. See, before with Moses, Moses had to raise a staff to split the sea. But God told Joshua and the priest to step into the water. And as they stepped into the water, the water would pull up against them. And everything else after them would dry up so that the Israelites could walk through. So we've experienced that. We've experienced Rahab and the spies. Where pastor taught us to pay attention to who has your ear. Sometimes you don't need so many people buzzing your ear about what they've seen. Maybe you sent out 12, and you have 12 different perspectives, and none of them are good. But God says, you know what? Maybe you just need two now. Just send two out to go scout the land. Send two out to bring you news, because you got two out of 12 that are telling you the truth. Everybody else is saying they're too big. You can't do it. They're too strong. It won't happen. And then we talked about Rahab, and Rahab teaches us that God uses unlikely people to do amazing things. You each have a story today. You each have a past. Your past is a testimony. Okay, you can't, I can't imagine trying to reach the loss if I never experienced anything. I said it this morning, I would rather take somebody that has slipped up in the past and has come through to experiencing God's mercy and God's grace to go ahead and reach the loss than somebody who's grown up in church but has never taken a step of faith to never experience anything. I would rather take a down and outer with a story than an up and comer that's got nothing. That's what we talked about there. We talked about circumcision and reputation. We talked about the cutting away of something that is dirty in your life in order, in order for you to move forward. We talked about how the circumcision means that you are set apart. It sets you apart. It is a marking that marks you and consecrates you as a child of God. Someone set apart with a purpose. Someone set apart for God's mission. And then when we talk about reputation, we talked about how before they even got to the land, the Canaanites were already afraid, not of Israel, but of God. God's reputation went before Israel and all the things that they had done and all the, all the victory that they had had because of God. The enemy feared God, and so it made them fear the, the Israelites too. 
We talked about Jericho. If you spent any time in church, you understand the story of Jericho. You understand that there's gonna be six days that they had to walk in silence. And that's hard for us to identify with. Why? Because none of us shut up. We wanna talk all the time. Somebody's giving me praise because we know we just talk too much. See, but on the seventh day, God said walk around seven times and on the seventh time, I want you to shout. That's your time to shout. That's your time to blow the horns. That's your time to blow the trumpet. That's your time to praise and to worship and watch what happens. Watch the walls come down. Then we talked about Achan's sin and how God had ordered them to not take anything from Jericho and yet this man, dummy, went ahead and took something that he shouldn't have taken and now there's sin in the camp. And then it goes on into the battle of Ai where we talked about how the Israelites thought that they could do it on their own. Joshua thought he could do it on his own. After God had been directing his path the entire time, he tries to do it on his own and they fail and they mess up. And that's why there's Ai part two because they tried it again because Joshua had to go back to God. He had to go back to the source. He had to go back to letting God direct their path. And with God's direction, they won. We continued on talking about the Gibeonites and we talked about alliance last week. God will always send unlikely people to align themselves with you. Why? Because they know the reputation of God. They see the proof in the pudding. They see what you're doing. They see what God, how God has changed you. And they're afraid that if they stand in your path, that God's gonna take them out. So they wanna come in alignment with you. They wanna build an alliance with you. And so these guys pretended to be travelers from far away land so that they could take an oath with the Israelites and be protected by them. But get this is the crazy part about that whole alliance. And yes, Joshua was upset that they lied to them, but this was an alliance that benefited the Israelites too because Gibeon was a big territory. One of the biggest out of those lands that I showed you in the map. And so when it came time for the battle with the five kings, the time that the sun stood still, that fight that I'm talking about that we talked about last week, Gibeon called on the Israelites. And the Israelites, I bet, were glad that they had Gibeon on their side because they like, just completely multiplied their numbers. And they helped. And they were an assistance in that war. So this is where we've talked about so far. Like I said, if it's way too much and you're like, whoa, that's like, that's too many, too many details. It's okay, just go back into the last few weeks. I encourage you to go back to the beginning of the year. Okay, we got these banners up here that talk about the year of better. Don't forget how we started this year. Don't forget the theme that is supposed to be uh, strung into every bit of our life for 2019. 2019 is the year of better. So make sure that you're walking in better. Don't forget, beyond that, when I preached back in like December 30th, I talked about how you got 52 weeks in 2019. Don't wait until December to, to say, you know what, in 2020, I want something better. Don't do that, okay? But think about this, think about how fast time flies. We're already like 10 weeks, eight weeks, or however many weeks, I think 10, 11, into 2019. What have you done with your time? Have you gotten better? Have you practiced the things that we've taught? Have you taught somebody what you've learned? Have you brought in people? Have you invited friends? Again, where's that challenge? Because we're so quick to start, but then we forget things. Pastors challenged us to invite 10 people a month starting in February. Have you done that? Have you passed out cards? Have you invited a friend? Have you invited an enemy? Have you invited a stranger? Have you handed out a card? Or did you just take a bag and it's just sitting at home? Think about the things that we've been charged with, church. Don't forget them. Maybe you need to go downstairs and grab some more cards because you did hand them all out. Awesome, props to you, we wanna keep it going. The work doesn't stop there. So here we are in chapter 11, and here's where we're jumping into in verses one through five, that's not on your screen, not on your paper, this is what's happened. They've taken over the Southwest, now they're gonna go up towards the Northwest, like I said, and Jabin, Jabin is a king of Hazer, and he's doing the same thing that the kings in the South just did. He's trying to get all these other kings together to start an alliance to fight the Israelites. If you heard what they just did, if you heard that they just beat these kings, why would you try to do it again? What do you think would be different for you? But the Bible also says this, that God was responsible for their stubborn hearts. Understand this, free will is the biggest form of love that you could ever experience from God. God allowed their hearts to be stubborn. God allowed them to be foolish and say, we're gonna go up against Israel next. God allows your heart to be turned should you choose to do that. 
God allows those things because he doesn't create robots. He doesn't create clones. So God allowed this king to have his heart turn stubborn and be like, you know what? I don't care what just happened. We're going to try it too, and we're going to win. Spoiler alert, they didn't win. Okay, sorry about that. But you can go ahead and you can read through it later on. Okay, and here where we jump into scripture, God is talking to Joshua and the Israelites. And in Joshua eleven six, 6, it says this. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them, because by this time tomorrow, I will hand all of them slain over to Israel. You are to hamstring their horses and burn their chariots. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them, because by this time tomorrow, I will hand them all over to you. So there's a couple of things we're going to grab from the scripture. The first thing is that God gave a command. God gives a command. Okay, he says, do not be afraid. It's not a suggestion, church. It's not a, hey, don't be afraid as long as. Don't be afraid if they. Don't be afraid because of. It just says, don't be afraid of them. And yes, there's good fear and bad fear that I talked about this morning. I'm going to talk a little bit about it with you tonight. Okay, there's good fear and bad fear. Pastor talks about fear, false uh, evidence appearing real. I want to take it a step further. It's okay to be afraid. But the truth with fear is this. It's about what the fear tells you and how the fear dictates what you do next. That's That's where the problem lies. If my fear paralyzes me, we got a problem. It's okay to be a fear. Fear sometimes is good to go ahead and analyze how things could work, where things could move, what what is the risk that needs to be taken, what is the next step, as long as I take that next step in fear. See, I said it this morning, I said, I'm not afraid of the dark, I'm afraid of getting hurt in the dark. Beyond that, I, I got this this afternoon, I might change it up. I'm not afraid of the dark, I'm afraid in the dark. I can see darkness, away from me and not be afraid of it. But the moment that I'm inside of it, I freak out. Why? Because there's at least potential for things. There is a connotation to darkness that darkness brings that I don't like. I cannot see what is in front of me, what is around me, what is beneath me. I cannot see what is coming at me, okay? Everybody hates stubbing their toe on the end table in the dark. It makes them mad. I can trip up in the dark. Somebody can come at me in the dark. I do not like the dark because of its potential, okay? I'm afraid of what the darkness brings, but again, don't let it paralyze you. There are gonna be moments that God commands you to not be afraid. See, I I gave up this story earlier today too. See, when I was a kid, the the darkness made me afraid. I grew up in Chicago, and I I kinda lied this morning. It wasn't really a lie, okay? But... (laughs) I said we didn't have air conditioning, and I was like, if my dad watches this, he's gonna be like, call me out and be like, we did have air conditioning. Okay, we had air conditioning, but I had a dad who would turn on the air conditioner at a certain point, okay? So it had to be like 92 degrees or hotter for the AC to turn on, okay? Some of you guys are those people. We'll pray for you at the end, okay? So it could be 89, and my dad's like, we're not turning on the AC, so we had to open the windows. And like I said, I grew up in Chicago, and I grew up on the south side of Chicago, and I did not like that my window was open. Because I did not like that potentially somebody could come through my window. So what did I do as an eight-year-old, seven-year-old? I'm not going to tell the truth and say 13-year-old, okay? (laughs) I put my toys out before the window because I knew that if it didn't wake me up with somebody creeping in, then I could go ahead and let them step on a toy, and that would alarm me that somebody was in my room. Mark Thomas, go, I'm, thank God Mark Thomas was not my parent because had I been a kid and done this and he found out, he was like, dude, they have shoes. I was like, dude, don't tell me that. Like my whole like, plan would have been ruined because they stepped on it with shoes and it didn't hurt them or anything, okay? But that's what I did. I was afraid of the dark, but you know what we do? We do that sometimes. We lay out our resources before our problem and we say, you know what? I may be afraid, but I'm gonna put it in my own hands. When God's saying, don't be afraid. Beyond that, as I got older, you know what else I did? I had my come to God moments every single summer when the window was open still, even at 10, 11, and 12, right? Because I wanted to be protected. So what did I do? I called upon the Lord. Just like when you guys go ahead and get pulled over and that's the only time you use God's name and talk to him, like, oh God, help me, okay? The same thing, I was like, God, if you just keep me and my family safe through this night, I'll give you my life. I'll repent from the things that I've done. I will carry my Bible everywhere I go. I'll be a missionary to Africa. I'll do all these things, right? (laughs) We do that too. 
We say, God, if you get me out of this, I will go ahead and do this. And when those moments come, guess what? We don't follow through. But God's saying, don't be afraid. And at the end of it all, understand this, despite your prayer, despite your, your lack of follow through, God still has your back. See, there's also a difference between the fear of things and the fear of God. The Bible uses the term fear of the Lord a lot. And the fear of the Lord translates into the awe of God. Okay, there's a difference between being afraid of something and being in awe of God. What the awe of God means, what it means to be in the awe of God, means that the shadow of his glory cast over me is greater than the shadow that my circumstance casts. See, I can see darkness ahead of me in my circumstance, but the truth, I won't even use the word shadow, I'll use the word light. God's light and his glory that casts over my problem gets rid of the shadow, gets rid of the darkness, so I can't be afraid. I can't focus on light and focus on the problem at the same time. If his light goes ahead and masks everything else, I focus on his light. I can't be distracted by the, 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 the big, uh, my big problem when I focus on being in awe of God, when I focus on God's glory. I can't be distracted by the details of my issues or the size of my enemy when I'm in awe of the greatness of God. And that's why he says, do not be afraid. Here's the second command in that. It says, hamstring their horses and burn their chariots. I had to look up what this meant, to hamstring a horse. But in battle, they would hamstring a horse and that meant to cut the horse at the hamstring. Why? Because then it couldn't put weight on it. It disabled it. It meant that it had no potential for use ever again. They couldn't use it anymore. It couldn't be picked up by an enemy or been uh, uh, used by an enemy to go ahead and have the advantage. That's what it means to hamstring a horse. So they went ahead and they hamstring the horses in war because it meant that they were no longer useful in war. See, sometimes you have to go ahead and disable the enemy so that they can't get back up to fight you. You have to go ahead and disable the resources of the enemy because that's what a horse was. Dif uh, disable the resources of the enemy so that they cannot get back up. You wanna know what that looks like in your life? That might mean you have to go ahead and delete a phone number. You know what I'm talking about? Girl, you don't need to be answering no phone call at 2 a.m. Boy, you don't need to be sending no text message at 2 a.m. Okay? That's just the truth. You have to go ahead and disable the resources of the enemy. You have to go ahead and block that phone number, block that person. You need to go ahead and remove yourself from the situation. You need to remove yourself from a friend group. You need to remove yourself from the negativity, the haters and the complainers. You need to remove yourself. You need to disable yourself and disable your, yourself from the triggers that trigger you, your anger, your disappointment, your frustration, whatever it is. You know you. So you know what's gonna work for you and you know what's gonna take you back to where you don't wanna go. So disable the resources of the enemy. Find accountability with somebody in the church. Find a mentor, find a leader. Remove yourself from an environment. Also get this, the Israelites did not have horses. So getting a horse, gaining a horse could be an advantage. If they had won so far without horses, having horses would give them a great advantage, but they had never had horses before. So I'm, I say that to tell you this, they didn't know how to use a horse. And they weren't gonna take time in the middle of battle trying to train a horse and figure out how to get on it and how to fight with a horse, okay? Stop trying to learn a new technique in the middle of a fight, okay? Work with what you got. Work with what you know. God equipped you, so use it. Don't try to fight how I fight. You can't fight how I fight yet. I can teach you some things. I'm teaching you things now. These are the moments to learn. This is the moment for training. But don't go out into the fight and try to do something that you kind of half heard and you didn't really take a note of and you haven't gone back to look, look back at what was said. You're gonna trip up, you're gonna slip up and when you mess up, what do you do? You can blame God. Right. Don't do that. They didn't use the horses and they made sure that the enemy couldn't use them again either. So also, if they were winning already without horses, could you imagine had they did know how to use horses, what that would mean? They have a great advantage and if they won, they would probably put their faith in horses. See, you don't need a horse for your fight. All you need is God, okay? Some of you are thinking that you need a horse to win, and some of you have used a horse to win, whatever that may be in your life. Understand, I'm not talking about a real horse, okay? <laughs> you may have used something in the past to help you win, and it's not working for this next fight. Stop relying on the horse. Start, keep relying on God. 
The horses in your life change all the time. The resources in your life change all the time, but God remains the same. Okay? Don't worry about what the resource is. If you had that resource when you won before, then you would just rely on it. But since you didn't have it, don't think you need it now. Without horses, you need God. But with horses, you think you did it on your own. See, having nothing produces dependency. Just like the Israelites in the wilderness. Where were they going to get their food from? God. On the daily. And God said, don't take anything into tomorrow because it'll spoil. And some people did. And guess what? They woke up and it was spoiled. God has what you need for that day. God has what you need when you need it. When you got nothing, the only thing you can possibly do is come in desperation dependent on God. And that's exactly where he wants you. Give him some praise. Come on. See, the Israelites could only win with one thing, really two, boldness and courageousness. In the beginning of Joshua, God tells Joshua, commands Joshua, be bold, be courageous. Be bold, be courageous. That was the only way that they were ever going to win. It wasn't with horses, it wasn't with swords, it wasn't with strategy, it was with God and his commands, be bold and be courageous. How do I know that that's true? Because also in scripture, whenever they were gonna come approach another people group that they were supposed to fight, the uh, Bible says that, that that group melted in fear. The only thing that really opposes fear is boldness and courage. That's all they needed. They didn't need anything else. They didn't need what the enemy had. Stop trying to fight fire with fire. This is the only time where you don't need it. That's like trying to fight the devil with sin. It don't work. You don't need it. Don't think that because the enemy has this resource, you need it too in order to advance. You don't need it. All you need is God. Also, in this verse, God gives a timeline. This time tomorrow. This time tomorrow. God doesn't always, but there are moments that God will give a timeline. Stop trying to do things on your own time. It's not going to work out. You heard the promise, and you're trying to manipulate the promise by getting it sooner rather than later. It's not going to work. Don't try to manipulate the promise. Stop trying to do things on your own timeline. God gave you a timeline. This time tomorrow, could you imagine had they gone and fought at midnight? They probably would have messed up again. So why are you trying to do it? God's saying this time tomorrow in your life, whatever it may be, this time next year, in 2019, in 2020, in your third year at this job, whatever it is, and if he hasn't done so yet, then it's okay. Pretend like you got some date on it because there is a date on your promise. You still just got to walk through knowing and walking in the guarantee of the promise. That's okay. I said this earlier too. When I was 18, I felt called to be a pastor. So you want to know what I thought? I thought it was at this church. I thought it was at that church. I thought it was doing that there. I was thought it was over here. I went through so many churches, not a ton, but a lot. Okay. I prefer that so many pastors. I came up under so many pastors and I love them all. None of them ever did me wrong. But 10 years, 10 years from the moment I felt it in my heart to the moment that I was on the stage ordained by Pastor Jeff. If it took 10 years, and if you knew it would take 10 years, would you still go through it? Because this is the thing, I walked through it and I didn't know. And I got turned down and I got led on and I got told no and all this stuff before it happened. Would you still walk through it? Would you still walk in the guarantee of the promise? Because it's not easy, but you can still do it. So he gives you a timeline. But see, here's the thing. Why do we falter then? We hear the promise. We may not have the, the date on it, or we do have a date on it, but we become impatient. So why do we slip up? Because we see the size of the problem. We see the length of the process. And we become discouraged. Why would you be discouraged in the process rather than rejoice in having access to the one who gave you the promise in the first place? I decide to go ahead and be with God because he's the one that gave me the promise. See, your circumstance might be easier if you had the confidence in the right thing. Don't have confidence in yourself. Don't have confidence in the things you do, the things you know, the things you've done, the things you've learned, the things you've experienced. Don't have confidence in your wife and in your spouse. Don't have confidence in your husband. Don't have confidence in your kids. Have confidence in God. Have confidence in the cross. Have confidence in his grace. Have confidence in his mercy. Have confidence in his salvation. Have confidence that Jesus died for you. And that's all that you need. That's where your confidence should be. Stop putting your confidence in your paycheck, 
It's going to waver. Stop putting confidence in your job. You may not have it tomorrow. I don't know. But I'm telling you that if my confidence is in my job and I lose it, then I'm going to freak out. But if my confidence is in God and I'm never going to lose God, then I'm always going to be strong in my confidence. You can give him some praise. And I love this part of Joshua when it talks about the command of the horses because the horses get me every time and they always point me to Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 5 or 12, there is a, a scripture here where God is talking to Jeremiah. And Jeremiah for the last few chapters has been talking about his enemies. He's been talking about this battle. He's been talking about being done fighting. I'm tired. I'm weary. I don't want to do this anymore. When are you going to take them out? When are they going to stop bothering me? All this stuff. And, and God goes ahead and he checks Jeremiah in his complaining and in his impatience. And it says this. It says, if you have raced with men on foot and they have worn you out how can you compete with horses if you stumble in safe country how will you manage the thickets by the Jordan and the thickets means the swelling up of the Jordan the rising of the water he's saying this to them if you can't deal with this how could you possibly deal with that when it comes get this He's, one, checking Jeremiah for being impatient, and two, telling him that should he actually get through this, there's going to be harder trials in store for him. So let me take some time, and let me go ahead and correct some things, and let me go ahead and redirect your mindset. God will not give you more to complain about, and yes, that includes trials. Trials are opportunities for you to grow, stretch, understand what you have, what understand your potential, and, and have an opportunity to grow and get stronger. But he's not going to give you more of that if you're going to complain about this. Okay, here's the next thing. Get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Some of you are freaking out because you decided to let Jesus into your heart and life hasn't gotten any easier. I'm sorry. And some of it might not change. In fact, it might get harder. I had to tell a teenager who said, you know what, my life has gotten harder since I decided to let Jesus into my heart. And I said, you know what, maybe you were just in the dark. Maybe you're just numb to the pain. Maybe you're just unaware. Because here's the thing, life may not get easier when you decide to let Jesus into your, into your life and take this faith walk seriously, but it makes it easier to go through those things. That's the truth of it. It makes it easier to go through those things. It, what happens is when you decide to let Jesus into your heart, there's a light over your life, and that light exposes things. That light exposes areas that you're supposed to work through, that you're supposed to develop on, that you're supposed to get stronger at, and you wouldn't have had access to those things had you not had the light. So don't become discouraged when all of a sudden life gets difficult when you're supposed to have all this peace. Guess what? You still have access to the peace. It's your choice to use it when there's a problem. So get comfortable with being uncomfortable in life. I said it this morning. I can't tell myself to run five miles if I'm complaining about three. There's still potential in three. There's still growth in three, but there's more benefit to five. I can't add more weight to the bar if I can't lift the bar. It's okay to work on just the bar. There is benefits to working with just the bar. I can work on my stability. I can work on my strength with just the bar. But I cannot go ahead and go from the bar to 45 pounds on each side. Maybe I just need to add 5 pounds at a time. But I'm not going to add 5 pounds or 25 pounds if I'm going to complain about just having the bar. See, again, there's a benefit to the growth. There's a benefit to the stretching. There's a benefit to the trial. So go ahead and get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Like I said, you don't need to learn how to live with peace. You just need to learn how to have peace and access the peace when there's a problem. You don't need to learn how to be joyful. You need to learn how to be joyful when there's a jam. You don't need to learn how to engage with God. You need to learn how to engage with God in the mundane Mondays, in the boredom of the day-to-day -day living. Sometimes we're always looking for the next come up that we start losing focus when we have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, three days in a row, a long stretch of time where we're just bored and there's nothing new happening. The thing is this, it's not that nothing's new happening, it's that you're not accessing God for something new from him, a new perspective from him, a new depth into him. You're not accessing his glory. You're not trying to learn more about him. Yeah. We live in the most Bible illiterate generation ever. I dare you, just for information's sake, now I'm not even tapping into Revelation yet, dive into the Bible and learn something that you haven't read before. Yeah. Try it. You have access to it, try it. See, just go study Jesus' life. Try it. There's going to be so many things that you learn, and I promise you that there's no way, there's no way that you can bond with God and be bored at the same time. There's no way. So try it out. Again, it's not about those things, like I said, peace and joy and engaging with God and bonding with God. It's not those things that we need to learn. It's those things, we need to learn those things in the middle of trials. That's really what we need to learn. That's really what we need to do. And actually, in this verse, the funny part is this. God is referencing two events that have already happened. See, one, when he talks about if you can't run with men, there's no way you'll run with horses, 
He's referencing Elijah in 1 Kings, where the Bible says that Elijah became full with a newfound power from the Spirit that he outran a chariot. And then he talks about the thickets and the swelling up and the rising up of the water of the Jordan. We're actually talking about that right now. That's, he's talking about Joshua. There's no way that if you can't walk on dry land that you're going to be able to trust God enough to, to, to step foot into the water and let it pull up against you. There's no way. He's talking about those things to Jeremiah right here. So again, if you're going to complain about this, there's no way that you can go ahead and have access to that. Okay? Here's the last piece. I said it this morning. You need to understand this. And when we read the Bible, I'm not reading stories. I'm reading accounts of events. Okay? So God's not meaning this running with horses and the swelling of the water metaphorically or uh, 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 figuratively. He's meaning it literally. Literally. You can have the power to outrun a horse. I can't imagine. I can't imagine. <laughs> but I trust God. I trust God to try and continue to have the same faith that the people who were talking face to face with him had. I want that type of faith because I know that I have access to him. So he's talking about literally. See, you aren't strong enough to handle these things, but guess what? You are strong enough to handle these things with God. See, because of Jesus, because of the power in his name, because of the power in his blood, and because of the Holy Spirit, we have never had to or we will never have to try something that we cannot do. And we'll never have to face a fight that God won't defend us from. This is what I mean about trials. Without the Red Sea, God would never have told Moses or could have told Moses to raise a staff. Without the Jordan River, he would have never told Joshua to step foot in it. Okay? Without the walls, he would have never commanded them to walk around them. Without the walls, they would have never seen him fall. Without a giant... David would have never seen the giant fall. Without a giant, they would have had no reason to go ahead and, and sling a rock. Without the war, the Israelites would have never seen the sun stand still. Let me take it a step further. Without the demotion, you would never be humble. Without the sickness or the pain, you would never need healing. Without a struggle, you would never pray. Without slipping up, you'd never need forgiveness. And without whatever circumstance you're going through, you'd never turn to God. You need the trials. I need the trials. We need the trials. And this is the point. The fight is supposed to be bigger than you. Let me say that again. The fight is supposed to be bigger than you, church. You're complaining because the fight's not smaller than you. It's not an easy fight. It's not supposed to be. Because when the fight's bigger than you, you're supposed to do the one thing you're supposed to do, and that's turn to God. See, again, I would rather live before God on my knees than walk this world high and mighty on my feet. I, don't, I won't have it. I would rather be on my knees my whole life asking for forgiveness, asking for mercy, asking for healing, asking for his provision, asking for him to defend me, asking for his promises, asking for his, his, uh, his love, asking for his mercy and his grace. I would rather do that in the midst of trial than never get to experience a trial and ever ask, ever. And so we continue on and we talk about giving God your problems completely destroyed. And we jump back into Joshua chapter 11. It says this, everyone in it, they put to the sword. They totally destroyed them, not sparing anyone that breathed. And he, Joshua, burned Hazor itself. As the Lord commanded his servant Moses, so Moses commanded Joshua and Joshua did it. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. So we talk about Hazor. The king was Jabin. I mentioned him earlier on. He killed Jabin, he burned the city. Why? Because Hazer started this. Hazer had the idea for the alliance. Hazer had the idea for war. Hazer was the one that was stubborn. So what do you do? You kill the problem at the head. You kill the problem at the head. See, what you're experiencing now with the anger, the depression, the anxiety, the frustration, the pain, the hurt, whatever, the backbiting, the backstabbing, all that stuff, it's a symptom. It's the what. Now you need to find the why. Find the why. Find the source. Find the head of the issue. Find the head of the problem. And beyond that, find the why. There is always a what or a why behind the what, and there is always a lie behind the why. You want to know what the lie is here? Their stubbornness. They thought they could do it on their own. They thought they could actually come against Israel. That's the lie. What's the lie in your life? The reason why you keep fighting the same issues is because you go ahead and you try to attack the symptoms, but you don't attack the lie. 
You don't tear apart the lie. And the Bible says here, they totally destroyed. They utterly destroyed. They completely destroyed. They got rid of the lie. They tore it up. They tore it from the head. No one could ever have access to Hazer again. No one could inhabit Hazer. No one could live in Hazer ever again. See, the same thing happens here in your life. When you go ahead and you burn unforgiveness, there's no way that you will allow someone else to live in unforgiveness. No one else around you will, want, will inhabit unforgiveness because they'll see that you have burned unforgiveness in your life. I challenge you. I challenge you to do the same. There's no way that I have, if I've overcome unforgiveness, that if I see someone else living in unforgiveness, I'm going to let them stay in it. Because I identify with it. I want them to fix it. I want them to experience forgiveness. I want them to let go of that anger and that pain and that hate. I want them to let go of it. I do not want them to live in it. That's why he destroyed Hazer. And that's why it's the only city that he burned. They totally destroyed it. Totally destroyed it. They gave up that city by destruction. They gave it to God, saying, we don't need it, we don't want it, you can have it because it's totally destroyed. It leaves no potential for me to ever live in there, ever go back to it, ever have access to it. I'm destroying it so I never go to it so you can have it, God. Do you do that with your problems? Do you do that with your issues? See, and now we continue on and we're gonna finish up chapter 11 because I told you that they won, that Israel won. And we skip over chapter 12, and you can go ahead and read chapter 12 on your own time. And all it does is it goes ahead and it lists the kings that Israel defeated. 31. 31 total. 31 kings. 31 lands of territory. 31 camps of warriors and soldiers that they defeated. Thousands and thousands and thousands. 31. That's a lot. And if they could do that, what can you do? Because we talked about it last week. There are going to be moments where you have spent your whole life swinging at one thing at a time, and that is a good strategy. Don't get distracted from that strategy. Swing at one thing. Fight one thing. Kill one thing at a time. Because you can't do five things at a time, six things at a time. But there are going to be moments in your life that God is going to bring five camps right before you so that you can knock out five things with one swing. And it happened again here. 31. But yet there's really only two big stories of battle. Really three. So... That means that you can do it too. And so that's what we're going to skip over in 12. I encourage you to read it. And we jump into chapter 13 where it says this. And this is really where I wanted to stick with. When Joshua had grown old, the Lord said to him, you are now very old and there are still very large areas to be taken. And the rest of the verses continue on with the descriptions of the land, the areas that he wants them to inhabit. And it jumps into chapter 6 and it, or in verse 6 and it says this. As for all of the inhabitants of the mountains, regions from Lebanon to Misferoth to uh, Maim, that is all the Sidonians, I myself will drive them out before the Israelites. I love this. Before I jump into really what I want to jump into, understand this. It says in the wilderness and in the mountains and in the forest and all of that stuff, those that are hiding, the problems that you cannot see, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to go ahead and drive them out and expose them before you so you can still go ahead and kill them. Okay? There's going to be things, the big things that you are focusing on, which are great. They, they, they deserve your focus on having to work through them, to having to knock them down, to having to destroy them in your life, to never have access to them again. But there are little things, little things that are still going to happen in your life that you're not even going to be aware of, but yet you still need to kill. And God is saying here, right here in verse 6, you know what? Even if it's hiding, my light will expose it. I will drive them out. You're going to get to see it, and you're going to get to destroy it too. And so, first one is where I want to focus. Joshua had grown old, and the Lord said to him, you are now very old, and there are still very large areas of the land to be taken over. So the Bible states that Joshua is old, and God acknowledges not just that Joshua is old, but he tells him, you are very old. You are very old. See, you guys are coming through whenever God tells you to do something, and you're listing the scriptures of why you cannot. I'm too old, I'm too young, uh, I, I, I don't know enough of the Bible, I've only been here for so long, I don't got the time, and God's going this, and he's giving you the courtesy of, okay, there's still more land to be taken, there's still more to do, there's still more things to get done, okay, you can go ahead and list off whatever reason you think you can't do it anymore, and here's the thing, Joshua didn't even do that, God just said, hey, I see this about you, but there's still more to do, there's still more land to be taken, Okay, God hears you. Guess what? You got your healing. There's still more to do. Okay, you got your salvation. There's still more to do. You got the job. There's still more to do. Okay, you invite a friend weekly. There's still more to do. There's still more to do. There's still more to do. There's still more land to have. 
okay? You read the Bible fully in a year, great, there's still more to do, okay? You memorize scripture, cool, there's still more to do. You take notes during sermons, cool, there's still more to do. Again, you invite friends, guess what, there's still more to do. You feed the hungry, great, there's still more to do. There's still more to do, there's still more to do, there's still more to do, church. There's still more to do, there's always gonna be more to do. If you think you've made it, you missed it, pastor says. You should never have the sense that you have made it, that you have gotten to learn and experience everything that you have in your walk with God. There's always a chance to go deeper. There's always a chance to go further. There's always a chance to stretch yourself. There's always a chance to do more. See, until, oh, until there is a soul, there isn't a soul that needs forgiveness, that needs God's mercy, that needs God's love, there's still more to do. Until there's not a mouth to feed out on the street, there's still more to do. Until there's a homeless person that doesn't, that doesn't need clothes, there's still more to do. Until your coworkers come to this church, there's still more to do. Okay, until your family, your sons, your daughters come to this church, there's still more to do. Until you have your come to God moment and you land on your knees, there's still more to do. Until you receive mercy, there's still more to do. Until you receive love, there's still more to do. Until you receive and experience forgiveness, there's still more to do. There's still more to do. There's a bunch of souls out in the world today that still have not had access to God because we are still more to do and other churches along with us have not done everything that we could do to say, you know what? I love you and I know where you've been because I've been there too and I don't want to experience it no more. I want you to have access just how I have access because there's still more to do. There's still more to do, church. Wherever you think you are, there's still more land to be taken. There's still more to learn. There's still more to experience. There's still a deeper level that you can go. Don't ever think that you've gone to as far as you can go. And this is what we learn from this scripture here. One, God's promise it isn't decided by practicality. He does not concern himself with, can it be done? Are you equipped enough for it to be done? Do you have the tools for it to be done? He isn't concerned whether or not it will work because with him it will work. He isn't concerned with how much progress you've made, how much you've grown. He isn't concerned with the resources that you have. God's promise is not decided by practicality. God's promise isn't dictated by probability. He doesn't care about probably. When he says it, it's a certainty. It has to happen. It will happen when he says it. He doesn't care about the chances. He doesn't care about the odds. He doesn't care about you, what you bring to the table. He doesn't care about the probably. It's going to happen. It's a certainty. And the last thing is God's promise isn't determined by the presumptions of others. The Bible says that Joshua's old. Joshua knows that Joshua's old, but God ignores it. Joshua's age comes with presumptions. Have people assumed things about you? because of your age, because of your capability, because of your educational background, because of your social status, because of your socioeconomic status, how much money you make, the job that you have, the clothes that you wear, the car that you drive. Have people assume something because you're too old or you're too young? Have people assume something because you've had this much education or not? Have people assume something because of the number of books that you have read or have not read? Have people assume something about you because guess what, they said it, you might believe it, but God ignores it. Whatever you even think about yourself, whatever you've told about yourself, Whatever you tell yourself, when you look in the mirror, God says it's a lie. I still have plans for you. There's still more land to be taken. I got a purpose for you. They call you old. They call you weak. They call you ill-equipped. They call you incapable, and you believe it, but God ignores it. They might assume something because of your past, but God is calling you because of your heart. Joshua 13 continues on with 6 and 7. It says this. A lot the land. Be sure to allocate this land to Israel for an inheritance, as I have instructed you, and divide it as an inheritance among the nine and a half tribes. Why nine and a half out of the twelve? Because two and a half had already received their inheritance on the other side of the Jordan. So they had already fought and they already gained ground on the southwest, and now they're looking to go up to the north. One uh, translation of scripture says this I will drive out the enemy and the people before Israel. All you have to do, all you have to do is allocate, divide up, give to as an inheritance. I don't know about you, but I can't really divide up something I don't have. So this goes beyond what I think and what I know and what I feel and what is practical and probable, okay? It doesn't make sense. Some of the instruction you'll receive from God will never make sense, okay? You are supposed to act like you got it and divvy it up like you have it 
before you even do. They hadn't even fought yet. They hadn't won yet. They hadn't even come to the enemy yet. But God's saying, all you have to do in order to win is divide it. It divided amongst the people before you even have it. Talk like you have it before you got it. The Bible says to speak things that are not as though they were. You got to work it like you got it. You got to live it like you got it. You have to believe God will give it to you before you have it. See, no one can argue a reservation. Some of you are sitting next to a reserve sign. You would be bold to move that reserve sign in this church. Okay? It's reserved for a reason. That means when the person that it's intended for comes to that seat, they can sit on it without argument. It would be bold for some stranger to come through to the restaurant that you had made reservations for and say, I don't care if you have a 7 o'clock reservation, I'm going to go ahead and take a seat. It don't work that way. They would be laughed out of the restaurant. See, there's a reservation for your promise. There is a reservation, a timeline, a date on your promise, on your purpose. It's here and you have access to it now and nobody can argue with it. Nobody can say anything else about it. No one can say that it's not going to happen. God already put his stamp on it. It's already going to happen. You just have to act and talk like you have it. Here's the thing. I couldn't imagine, I still can't comprehend writing a will, leaving something for my daughter that I do not currently attain, that I don't currently have. But guess, guess what? I'm not the source. The Israelites weren't the source. Joshua wasn't the source. You got to go to the source. And the source has it all. God has it all. Jesus has it all. Jesus paid it all. So when he says, go ahead and, and, and allocate the land and give it up as an inheritance, Inheritance means I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it soon. And we all have an inheritance in Christ. Ephesians 1 says this, It is in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us. He had designs on us for glorious living. Part of the overall purpose, he is working out in everything and everyone. It is in Christ that you once you've heard the truth and believe it, the message of your salvation, found yourselves home free, signed, sealed, and delivered by the Holy Spirit. This sign it, the Holy Spirit, from God is the first installment of what's coming, a reminder that we'll get everything God has planned for us, a praising and glorious life. Another translation starts this off by saying, it is in Christ that we have obtained an inheritance. It only happens if you're in Christ. Your inheritance for your purpose the plan God has for you, the promise God has for you, the land that you're supposed to take, the promotions, the job, the joy, the peace, the grace, the mercy, it's all inheritance in Christ. So when I read in Christ, it says it twice, in Christ, in Christ. My mind immediately goes to there's possibility for you to be out of Christ. I talked to the last time about coming out of alignment with God. You can still have good things and still be out of alignment. So don't let the devil trick you with that. You heard truth here today. You think you, you got blessing, you got, you got blessing. God still blesses you, but you could have way more. But it only happens in Christ. You have an inheritance in Christ. You wanna know who doesn't get an inheritance? Illegitimate children and orphans. They have nobody to claim them. So they don't really have anything left for them. But God says, all are welcome into my family. God calls you son, God calls you daughter, God calls you family, God calls you child of God, God calls you his own. So you have access to the inheritance, you have access to his family. So where are you at? Have you obtained it? Have you spoken things that aren't as though they are? Do you believe you have it before you got it? You have an inheritance. Before you even knew about Christ and his saving grace, it says he already knew you. He had a plan for you, had a purpose for you. And the Holy Spirit deposited into your life is only the first thing of things to come. Would you stand with me, church? Are you in Christ tonight? Do you have access to the inheritance that we've laid before you? Do you have access to peace, to the comfort, to the love, to the joy, to the mercy, to the grace? Do you have access to his provision? Do you have access to your purpose? Do you know who you are yet? And do you know who are you have been created to be in this world yet? Are you in Christ? 
If you're not, or you've come out of Christ, I want you to come to this altar. By you coming to this altar, you're saying, you know what? I slipped up. I messed up. I'm not where I need to be. But I want to be in Christ. You're saying my heart's not right. My mind may not be right. I might have faltered. I don't even know where I'm going anymore. But I want to be in Christ. If you come to this altar, you're coming to this altar, you're saying... I've experienced blessing. I've experienced all the good things that I have so far in this world and in my life. But I know it's nothing without God. And I want what God has for me, not what this world has for me. You all made a bold step tonight. Because you're acknowledging that you need more than you. You're acknowledging that you need God. You're acknowledging that you can't do it on your own. You're acknowledging that you slipped up, messed up, and you know what? I need to go ahead and repent. And this just isn't for them, church. This is for you too. And so we're going to pray this all together. Would you bow your heads? You can repeat after me. You can say it in your mind and in your heart. Say, dear God, I thank you that you sent your son down for me to die on the cross and three days later, rise again. I'm sorry for what I did. I'm sorry for what I'm doing, but I'm turning away from that. I repent from my ways. I've missed the mark, but I know with you, I have forgiveness. I'm choosing tonight to let you into my heart and let you into my life to call you savior to call you redeemer, to call you provider, and to call you waymaker. I thank you. I love you. In your name we pray. Amen. I want to go ahead and I want to open up this altar to everybody else in this church today. See, I don't call you to the altar because they need a crowd. I call you to the altar for you. I call you for the, uh, to the altar so that you have time with God, so that you get closer to God. The experience in a game is great when you're closer, so how much more can you experience when you are closer to this altar with God? Today, I would open up this altar to you as we sing out Waymaker right now, because some of you need a Waymaker. You need to see open. You need that forgiveness made. You need that plan to be spoken over your life. You need that promise. My God. That is who you are. Some of you need to just sing to God who he is so that your heart believes it again. He doesn't need to know. You do. Miracle worker. He's a promise keeper. He's the light in your life. When you can't see, when you're afraid, he is God in your life. When you're in pain, when you're struggling, he is. When you need forgiveness, he is. When you need provision, There is something that you need tonight, and this is the only way that you're going to get it, by coming to this altar and declaring who he is in your life. Sing it out.
ahead, sing it out. Work a promise. I told you we had worshipers tonight. Yeah. You don't need the band. You can sing it on your own. Sing it again, Waymaker. Come on. because you know what we did that heartfelt moment the spirit of God is moving the spirit of God has called those to repent we had we prayed that prayer and we sang this song declaring who God is in our lives that's a great spot to end on but there's still more there's still more and I'm telling you tonight there's still more because I'm not gonna let you leave without knowing how we fight our battles this week I'm not gonna let you leave in a, in a place down here I want you up here I want the energy up here how we fight our battles and I don't care if you came surrounded today you're surrounded by God not the enemy so be surrounded by his glory today church come on
that you stand with us, you stand behind us and you go before us. Lord, I pray for the eyes to see your light, the light guiding us. I thank you for Pastor Danny and for the transformative message that you deposited into his spirit for us to listen to and to deposit into our spirit. So as we go, God, I ask that we leave these doors different people than how we walked in. Teach us how to love you and love others the way that you love us. And we pray all of these things in the mighty, gracious, loving name of Jesus. And everybody screams!